you look back on history, you can find numerous accounts of small units holding off a far superior enemy force, accomplishing things that you and I think are next to impossible. Well, the American Civil War was no different. And throughout the war, individual regiments would step up and not only take on divisions and brigades by itself, sometimes they would buy time for the army as a whole to either escape or regroup. And that was no different here on July 2nd of 1863. And the regiment that we're gonna be covering today is the 1st Minnesota. And their charge here today not only saved the Union Army from being defeated on July 2nd, they possibly saved the entire Army of the Potomac from being defeated and Lee marching on DC. So we're on top of the Pennsylvania Monument here. I just wanna orient you as to where we are here. So in the distance there, you see Little Round Top and Big Round Top. Panning to the right would be Devil's Den. Can't really see it and then we would have the wheat field. And in this direction in the distance, if you can see some of the monuments there, that is the peach orchard. And that would be the right flank of where Sickles would move his forces forward in the famed salient. Now, the Confederates would smash into the salient, driving back Sickles' forces. And the Confederates would threaten the entire Union line here, especially in the center, um, to support Sickles' salient. Meade had to move troops around, creating gaps in the Union line which made this area dangerously thin. So we've moved from the top of the Pennsylvania Monument there, and we are back down facing the direction of the Peach Orchard, where General Longstreet was assaulting on July 2nd. Now Sickles Corps was beginning to falter and fall back in disarray, and Longstreet's men continued to advance towards our position here, threatening uh, the entirety of the Union line, especially the center. And like we touched on up above, there were some gaps opened up in the Union line. If you recall, they uh, established a fish hook, a tight, compact defensive position. Well, Sickles would move his men forward, and Meade would send reinforcements to support Sickles because he physically didn't have enough men to defend the terrain that he was hoping to hold. Well, that brings us to our location. And right here, in this general area, this is where the first Minnesota would have been positioned when a man by the name of General Winfield Hancock would arrive and approach the 1st Minnesota. Now General Hancock would see the 1st Minnesota position here. They were originally brought up to support a battery uh, behind the peach orchard here. And he would ride up to the 1st Minnesota, point to the direction of the advancing Confederate brigades, and he would yell to their commander, who was Colonel William Colville, and said, take those colors. Now keep in mind, if uh, the unit sizes kind of confuse you, just know that a regiment is far smaller than a brigade. And in fact, it takes numerous regiments to actually make up one brigade. So in this direction, you had almost two full Confederate brigades advancing on the sole regiment here of the 1st Minnesota. Now the 1st Minnesota knew they weren't going to win this day, but their goal was to buy enough time and halt the Confederate advance for me to bring up reinforcements from elsewhere on the line here. Now, before we walk in the footsteps of the 1st Minnesota to halt the Confederate advance, uh, they were one of the first regiments in 1861 to answer Lincoln's calls for volunteers. And they would arrive in Washington, D.C. with almost a thousand men. Now, fast forward a few years here at Gettysburg, and they took the field with about 420 men, but they didn't have all their men at their disposal. They had a company detached, I believe, on the Union right, and they also had another company uh, acting as skirmishers somewhere along the line here. So they would make this charge with a little under 300 men. And again, we're facing over a thousand Confederates here in front of us. I'm gonna back up here a bit and you can see the monument. And this is the spot where the first Minnesota would begin their charge to halt the Confederate advance there. Now that charge would advance all the way up to that thicket of trees there, which is where we're gonna head. So if you're wondering, this charge took place on July 2nd, around six o'clock. And the first Minnesota was outnumbered six to one. Now an account from Lieutenant William Lochran would recall, every man realized that order meant death or wounds to us all. And they were staring at over a thousand men bearing down in their positions. Fixing bayonets, 262 members of the first Minnesota would begin charging across this field courageously. and. Man after man would fall in the furious attack. Their gallant charge and the attacking Union units on either side forced the Confederates to retreat. Now, out of the 262 men here, 215 would be killed, wounded, or captured. So, we're making our way across the very field that the 1st Minnesota would have began their charge on. And if you can see behind me, numerous tour buses visiting the Pennsylvania Monument here, not one person walked down this area of the battlefield. They all walked around the monuments, which is fantastic. 
But they would get on their buses and leave, and not one person walked down this direction to uh, walk the very field of the first Minnesota. And this is exactly why I'm doing this video. Countless regiments uh, go unnoticed for their actions. You know, the first Minnesota today, we touched on the 16th Maine on Oak Hill on the first day of the battle. These regiments uh, would never be the same after this battle, but yet they saved hundreds and hundreds of lives that allowed soldiers to fight another day. And uh, this is why we're here. This is the very ground that the first Minnesota not only saved the Union Army on day two, but possibly saved the Union Army as a whole. Continuing down towards where the first Minnesota would meet the Confederates, and like the sign stated up above, man after man, fall to your left, fall to your right, and still, these men kept pushing forward. I couldn't imagine staring at an overwhelming enemy force, charging down with all the momentum in the world. They have this driven all your comrades off the peach orchard. And now you and 262 other men are charging, outnumbered six to one. And these men did this without hesitation. I, uh, I'm having a hard time processing what they were thinking here. So we're getting a little closer to the end of the charge here. And this is the general area where the first Minnesota would slam into the Confederates. Now they wouldn't charge headlong into the overwhelming Confederate force, but they would stop just short of the Confederate forces here and begin delivering accurate and deadly volleys into the Confederates. And they would stop and start returning fire. Now the Confederates, taking advantage of their numbers, began to deploy forces on the first Minnesota's right flank. And in return, the first Minnesota would do something called refusing the line, which would mean that the regiment would spread out in a thinner line to cover the flanks here. And they would stay at this location, delivering volley after volley as man after man would fall here. Now, we've talked about this charge. Within five minutes, 215 of those 262 involved members would be casualties here. That number of 85% casualties, that took place in less than five minutes. I mean, man, I, I wish I can do more to try and bring you here and just feel the magnitude of this place. I hope this video does just an ounce of justice uh, of the first Minnesota sacrifice here. And you can see there's another vehicle leaving without coming down here in the background, but that's why we're doing this. So we've come to the end of the field on the outskirts of the wood line here. And just to show you, where we started from. The first Minnesota monument where they would begin their charge is right in this area here. So uh, maybe a little more than 100 yards, maybe 150 at the most, but here is the very field. The brave men of the first Minnesota would blunt the Confederate advance. So while this really isn't related to the first Minnesota, uh, this is a monument dedicated to Colonel L. Willard. I think it was Lamb Willard was his first name, but he was the commander of the 125th New York Infantry. And they took part in the charge here as well. The first Minnesota would do it first and they would come up in support to help drive the Confederate forces from this area. And this is the area where Colonel L. Willard would be killed in action. Now, something that's interesting about the 125th New York Infantry is they were part of the branded uh, Harpers Ferry Cowards. When Harpers Ferry would fall to General Jackson and his men, I believe in 1862, uh, just before the Battle of Antietam, they would be sent to Camp Douglas where they would have to be uh, uh, exchanged or paroled. So they weren't uh, really able to fight until the Battle of Gettysburg here where they were looking to redeem themselves. And uh, they saw some action in this area as well. So this marker at the end of the wood line here I thought was worthy of sharing. And uh, we're going to head back to the Pennsylvania Monument and uh, wrap this episode up here. So if you find yourself in Gettysburg and you're near this beautiful Pennsylvania Monument, you can't miss it. It's one of the uh, largest monuments here on the battlefield. Uh, maybe take a few minutes and uh, head over to the first Minnesota Monument and uh, take a gander at the very field where they would lose so many men saving the Union Army here. It's not much to look at, but that's okay. We can still take a few minutes out of the day and uh, remember their sacrifice here. This was a really cool visit and uh, walking in their footsteps was a very humbling experience. Well, now we're off to the next site here at Gettysburg. And as always, catch you on the next one.